The next theorem is called Bolzano's theorem. And yes, that's the same Bolzano from bolzano weierstrass theorem that we saw uh, recently. It'll look very familiar to something you remember from calculus, uh, and we're working up to the intermediate value theorem. This is a little bit more specific than the intermediate value theorem. And it starts off, if f mapping the closed interval from a to b into, the, into r, so it requires, Bolzano, Bolzano's theorem requires that the domain be a closed interval, closed bounded interval, if f is continuous and the value of the function at a and the value of the function at b have opposite signs, then there is a c strictly in between a and b where f of c equals zero. So we found a zero <clears throat> of that function. It would be an x-intercept if we graphed it. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the proof. The, the proof is in the text. I'm going I'm to sketch through it right here on the board. Uh, I'm not going to be a rigorous proof. So we will assume, as my picture shows here, here's our interval from A to B, and here's the function f. We'll assume that f of A is less than 0 below the x-axis. f of B is greater than 0 above the x-axis. We're going to define three sequences, xn, cn, and yn. xn and yn are going to be the endpoints of an interval for each n. cn is going to be the midpoint of that interval. So x0, y0 is just like we have here on the board. x0 is a, y0 is b, c0 is the midpoint between them. Add them up and divide by 2. The next element in the sequence, the three sequences, will be x1, c1, and y1. And we, do, we go this way. If f of the previous one, see we're now on n equal 1, if f of 0 was less than, f of c0 was less, is less than 0, um, which it is, we're going to do this our new x1 is going to become c0. So we're going to shrink this interval in half. This is my x1 now. Maybe I'll use a alternate different colors. x1 is going to be here. y1 is going to remain the same. No change there. So we just cut this interval in half, the width of it. And then C1 is going to be the midpoint there. So now we still have a closed interval, this time from X1 to Y1, half the width of the original one. F of X1 and F of Y1 have opposite signs. And then we repeat that to get X2. Well, if you look at the midpoint, F of C1 is still negative, so this is going to become X2. 2 and y2 no change and c2 will be the midpoint and so on i'll do maybe i'll do one more let's see let's say the that's x1 let's say c2 is the midpoint there so it looks like this time f of c2 is positive so for the next interval x2 wouldn't change and y2 x Three will become what x2 was, y2 is going to get moved. Y3, the new y3 is the old c2, and so on. So what we're doing is we're shrinking that interval by half each time, where the endpoints are such that uh, f of the left one is negative, f of the right one is positive. So we're honing in on this point right here. And what makes this work is that uh, xn is an increasing sequence. Not necessarily strictly increasing, but monotonically increasing. yn is a decreasing sequence. And what is the width of the interval? Well, that's just 
xn minus yn divided by 2 to the nth power. Let me make sure I got the index correct. So for x0, y0, the, it, it was a minus b, yeah. And it would be divided by 2 to the 0, which is 1. So this goes down to 0, the distance between them. So they're converging in on the same number. And f of xn, in this case, is always negative, less than or equal to 0. Um, f of yn is always greater than or equal to 0. So they are home, honing in to the same number. And that number happens to be c. So f of c would be 0. So again, I didn't rigorously prove it, just kind of sketched through it.